Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 727. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 12th, 2022. Thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down and we talk about the news. Now, it's not always just the news. Sometimes we talk about politics. Sometimes we talk about war. Sometimes we talk about Anglican news and Christian news. There's a lot that happens here. And the funny thing is we sit down and we really never know how long the show is going to take. Sometimes we plan for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And when we get to the end of the show, it's 45 minutes and 50 minutes, and sometimes there's an hour episode. We're kind of, we don't want to act shocked, but we're shocked. Because when we sit and talk, time just disappears. You know, it's like uh, two buddies sitting down and just hashing out what they know and what they saw and what they read and what they feel. And you guys, for some odd reason, like to see us hash that out, and we really appreciate that. And Anglican Unscripted is nothing without the viewer, and thank you for watching, and thank you for hanging out with us. <sighs> After all that, George, how you doing? Holy Week, it's joy, anticipation, expectation. It's all coupled to good things, bad things, exciting things, scary things. Mm -hmm. I'm now, I'm going through the first blush of home ownership, our first home. Kevin, this is old hat to you. You've had houses for I'm years so that were yours. <laughs> yes. But for us, this is the first time. Yeah. And I'm almost 60 years old, and I finally own a house. I'm saving those nickels every day. So yesterday, when I got home from work, it's great. The sun sets around quarter of eight here at night. Mm -hmm. uh, and I pinched the power uh, washer from the church's garage we say borrowed. Was borrowed borrowed yeah, well borrowed. i got it back this morning before anybody <laughs> noticed and was power washing the sides of the house getting off mold and mildew and mm -hmm. cleaning the driveway and just lots just little homeowner things that uh that i now i'm doing it for something that's ours not sure. something that belongs to somebody else yeah. so it's exciting times had discouraging emails from friends in Europe about the war in the Ukraine, having wonderful emails, actually text messages from our daughter who's just moved to San Francisco and has a new apartment in the Mission District. Um, and then we have the round of services taking place that is just so joyful and fulfilling uh, being part of a Christian community. Yeah, I mean, this is you know our our time in history for our own holy week you know we we have the the great news and great anticipation of uh christ's arrival and walking into jerusalem and uh people celebrating and throwing the leaves on uh, the the palms on the on the ground as they 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 wait the anticip the anticipation has arrived he's going to take control he's going to uh retake uh, Judaism and, and throw out the Romans and this is our king and you know by Friday well that that didn't work too well you know <laughs> so and, and that's kind of the ups and downs we have here as well I, I I'm completely depressed by the Russian Ukrainian war um, I, I hear about the war atrocities now that are uh, becoming more and more apparent beyond what, what we just read in the press uh, I have uh, friends in Crimea and uh, in Eastern Europe are, are confirming uh, beyond what we see in the press that yeah these atrocities and these rapes and uh, uh, these people being bound and shot that they're real it's not just uh, the Ukrainian version of Pravda and so that's hard to, to watch I, I never thought I'd go through another war after we saw what happened uh, you know in the, in the late 2000s so here we are again yeah, as sad as can be it, it, I too, Kevin, was skeptical about the reports of atrocities. I, I didn't deny them, uh, but I've been fooled. I was fooled about weapons of mass destruction sure. in Iraq. I was fooled about Saddam Hussein's troops going into maternity hospitals in Kuwait and throwing babies out of incubators into the street and bayoneting them. 
Uh, I was a child, but Lyndon Johnson fooled me about the uh, Ton Gulf of Tonkin incident, uh, allowing us to bomb North Korea, uh, yeah. North Vietnam. About, yeah. And so I, I'm not saying I disbelieved it, but I withheld judge, judgment until I had some sort of sense that it was true. Now, I'm not saying the Ukrainian government is perfect and the Russians are monsters. Uh, there's evil on all sides, there's good on all sides. But the, and I don't particularly trust what I watch on TV because my experience of covering religion and when I see the networks cover religion, they get it wrong. And that's something I know about and I know they get that wrong, so what are they getting wrong about other things? Sure. Well, I, I mentioned uh, our parish sponsors a missionary. It's a girl from our congregation. Girl, she's in her 30s now. Uh, she was a girl <laughs> when she started. For the last uh, eight years, she has been a missionary with a Christian organization working in Hamburg in the uh, St. Pauli district in the red light district. She has a ministry to prostitutes, fallen women. Most of these women are from Eastern Europe or, or Africa. And so she has formed relationships with these women and she helps them escape from prostitution, escape from the mafia, the Russian mafia that controls it. And well, with Wayne, her, her permission society has sent her to Poland to help work at some of the refugee camps because of her experience working with Ukrainian women in uh, the brothels of Hamburg. And she sent a little email and she asked us not to share it because she uses names and she doesn't, it doesn't want to get back to people behind the Russian lines. But evidently the Russians, according to what she is being told, are engaged in a war of rape mm -hmm. and looting and murder. Um, this is, the Russians are treating the Ukraine like they treated Chechnya. This is not a, a European war, this is a Balkan war where the Serbs and the Croats and the Kosovos take no prisoners and they despoil and rape the women, shoot the men. And she shared some horror stories of that were shared by survivors of rape of a family of young girls where uh, they were all raped repeatedly for three days because the Russians have sort of settled into their house. And, you know, the mother and the father were shot immediately and the girls were raped and one of them had a child and her husband was off fighting and she was shot in front of her six-year-old I wasn't there I didn't see it I don't know this but this is being passed to me from someone other than CNN or Fox so I think the balance of probabilities is that uh, these stories of atrocities I don't know they may not be universal but they certainly are taking place yeah, and it's very frightening to think we live in a world like that right now. Yeah, it's frightening that we live in that world now, but that was World War Two, that was World War One, mm -hmm. that was you know, uh, rape has always been a spoil of war, one of the worst spoils of war. When soldiers come in and they want to decimate a community, they do that by raping the women, and uh, um, it's sad because you and I both have daughters, and mm -hmm. maybe it just hits us harder, but. Uh, it's it, it, that just steams me to no end, and so you know. And I have I have to admit to some emotional disquiet because mm -hmm. this sort of thing has been happening in the Congo for years, mm -hmm. in northern Uganda for years. Sure. The Lord's Resistance Army would in northern Uganda would move into a village and do this exact sort of thing. This is happening with the Islamist jihadists in the Congo and in. Uh, Niger and, and northern Nigeria and I guess I thought European warfare would be cold and clinical and you know like a, a video game uh, so it's my naivete and my foolishness and I guess uh, the evil that is in men's hearts gets brought home by these things and the Ukrainians and Russians like hold themselves out as civilized European nations, yet they're behaving in bestial, what we would call medieval ways. Well, I hope this gives this Gen Z generation a glimpse of what real evil looks like and what 
uh, totalitarianism looks like and what uh, taking away people's rights of free speech and free assembly looks like. Um, because I think they've lost that. You and I, we grew up in the Cold War. Yeah, we always mm-hmm. knew who the enemy was, what the enemy's tactics were, how the enemy had fenced in their people so they couldn't leave. Um, we had a really good understanding of communism, and we had great leaders to fight that communism. Here, we're, 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 we'll be on that time. And it, it, history repeats itself. You know, Jimmy Carter was president. His main enemy was the Soviet Union, who had just invaded Afghanistan. He couldn't control inflation at all either, and so we had high gas prices and gas shortages. And the inflation rate back then was seven two seven four. Um, come forty years later, we have Biden, <laughs> and Biden has reintroduced runaway inflation, high gas prices, and the enemy again, Russia. So not much changes yeah. in history. Well, one and a half percent was the inflation rate for the month of uh, March. Mm-hmm. That's tw- that's eighteen percent annual inflation, um, and they don't measure things like food and gasoline. I think in these things because those are the most things that fluctuate most wildly. Mm-hmm. But goodness me, I mean, if we're going to things are going to get worse before they get better. Twenty percent sure. inflation is not mm-hmm. on an annual basis is not unrealistic. Uh, but the last time we filled up the RV, uh, I think it was October before we uh, arrived back to Florida, 220 bucks to fill the whole tank. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Uh, when we leave here, when we fill the tank, it's going to be about $600 to fill the tank each time we fill the tank. I'm not going to tell you my gas mileage because it's really, really bad. But to get up to Wisconsin and start visiting people again, uh, it'll probably be a tank, you know, or a tank and a half. Um, I get 150 gallons in this beast. <laughs> you know, I'm not looking forward to it. I happen to be in the position where I can afford the, the upcoming inflation. But there are so many people here in Florida and around the country who are very ill prepared for this inflation, who are going in and, and um, are kind of giving up. They don't want to work. Kids don't want to work anymore. Uh, you and I went out to eat uh, in the Villages, which is a retirement community here in Florida, and I had to wait 20 minutes in line to reserve a seat. They only probably 45 tables in this little restaurant, and they were only serving 10 because they only had the wor- two wait staff who could wait on those tables. And, <laughs> and our waitress was a vegan. <laughs> she Jill was asked, vegan. "Would Jill asked uh, would she recommend the meatloaf?" And the girl made her face. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I said, it, but at dessert time, I'd like a tall house brownie. She said, oh, you want one of those? They're so dry. I was touching them before I came out here. And no, okay, I, I don't think I'll have a tall house brownie. Then. Yeah, Thank I, you, because she's been poking them. Because well, this so this the, the, the way the, the job, yes. <laughs> yeah, so the staff, you can get. I, Susan and I went through McDonald's drive through It's a little habit we do. Um, and for 30 odd years, I've had the, we've had the same things and we know how much it would cost. And today I, we bought something and it was a dollar fifty more. Uh, and I looked at it, did they tri- double or treble something? And uh, no, um, they just, the prices have now been passed on to the consumer that the and as I drove up, it's a sm- we live in a small town. Uh, I knew the uh, the manager of the McDonald's, and he's at the window. And usually they have some high school kid at the window or some senior citizen, and he's at the window. And I was saying, well, gosh, it's it's uh, unusual to see you uh, doing this. He said, we can't even at eighteen dollars an hour, we cannot staff this restaurant. Um, we can't get high school kids at eighteen dollars an hour. Um, I just don't understand. Well, I'm not an economist. I, I know a little bit, but this can't continue, uh, and our co- our country remain strong economically. You know, well, I I think there'll be certain resets in this. Um, right now, you know, you can go to college, and uh, if you take out student loans, you don't have to repay them back yet. You know, there's been this constant hold. Uh, we, we have a, a college loan for Ben. And we keep getting an email every month. Oh, don't worry about paying it yet. No interest. You're yeah. not paying it. Yeah. 
This yeah, it's it, been pushed now to what August thirty first. August thirty first, and you know we have the money, but I can I can make money on Wall Street, uh, pretty well before I pay off Ben's uh, college loans. So, and Kevin, to be honest, you'd be foolish to to pay it off because the the bets are that the uh, administration will cancel student loans before the election. Got it. They need something to bring the base out to vote for them. Yeah. And a trillion dollar gift to the middle classes, uh, it's just the thing. The working class have abandoned the Democrats. They don't have student loans. But people like you and I who have children who had student loans, uh, you know, a gift. Uh, even though I wouldn't vote for the government, I'd still take <laughs> their money if they cancel the debts. Well, it, it's interesting because everything that the left has stood for as far as uh, climate change and all that, they're, they're throwing out the window in, o in order to save the next election. Uh, Biden announced today uh, that they will abandon ethanol additives to gas um, because it, it raises the price of gas and it, it pays off the, the corn lobby, <laughs> a very powerful lobby. And then they're going to abandon uh, adding uh, the, the sulfur additives or the desulfur additives to diesel. And they're going to make basically gas less healthy. I don't think they're going to re-add the lead to it. It will have leaded gas of the 70s. But, you know, they're abandoning everything for this next election because it's going to hurt. If you are a believer in uh, moderate or liberal or excessive liberal uh, 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 Democrats, uh, you're not going to be very pleased uh, come November and, and 2024. So... Oh, well, let's get on to some other news. Let's talk about uh, Anglican news. We talked last week about the communique uh, put out by the primates meeting and the follow-up press conference by uh, Archbishop Justin Welby and uh, two other primates. And I kind of want to follow that up uh, and talk about it because uh, some blogs out there have responded to our comments about it, and it was interest an interesting read. So uh, let's talk about Anglican Futures, George. Anglican Futures, which is a great organization, Susie Leaf and company, uh, uh, sort of the Anglican evangelical opposition, both in and outside the Church of England, mostly outside at this stage. On their website, they posted a very long op-ed where they looked at the primates' communique. And many of the points they made, we've made, but they went much deeper than we did into the conversation, where they noted that the uh, communique itself was about localized issues, uh, political unrest in Pakistan, so on and so forth. Uh, mosquito nets may or may not be. Deforestation Could, in the Amazon. Climate change, the climate emergency. Emergency. You know. All worthy topics, but mm -hmm. all, but none of them church-centric uh, issues, things that are being addressed by governments and NGOs. Then at the press conference, as we pointed out, Anglican Futures pointed out as well, that Justin Welby usurped the communique and gave it his own spin, where the lines from the communique about you know these social issues that we're going to address were lost in Justin Welby's comments that we've all agreed not to talk and not to revisit the human sexuality and the issues that are dividing the communion. And then Welby went on to say that uh, he regretted the uh, absence of the Nigerians, Ugandans, and Rwandans, but he did it in such a way and he mischaracterized why they weren't there. He essentially said they weren't there because of cooties. They could not sit next to Michael Curry of the United States or Mark Strange of Scotland because those fellows had cooties. No, that's not why they're not there. Okay, hold they're on. Not we, have there. A, we have an international audience. We want to explain cooties. Uh, cooties is what uh, children in elementary school, you know, oh, we don't want to sit next to them. They're icky people. Yeah. They're uh, I, unclean. I don't want to sit They're... next to girls because girls have cooties. Girls don't want to sit next yeah. to boys because boys have cooties. Ew. Yes, yes. Ew. Essentially, that's what Justin Welby was saying. The Nigerians think people have cooties uh, because of their support for human sexuality issues, liberalization of those issues. Well, that's not why. It's because Ron Williams and now Justin Welby have declined to exercise leadership, have declined to act upon the requests made by the primates 
and the Nigerians and company basically are saying, we don't really recognize your authority. You have not used it uh, in light of, the, of what you have been given, and in fact, you have abused it. Our problem is with you, Justice, Justin. Now, we do have problems with the others for these issues. But I rem you remember Henry Arambi telling you and me, Kevin, and I sit down, you know, we were just chatting. Mm -hmm. I j Henry Arambi, the former primate of Uganda, said, I really want to sit down with Gene Robinson sure. and take as long as it takes to thrash these issues out. Yeah. So it's not a question of cooties that we're not going to be there, but rather the Nigerians and company, the GAFCON conservatives, see the whole game as being rigged. And what did Justin Welby do? He rigged the primaries communicate. Well, Rowan Williams had previously rigged Lambeth. Remember Indaba? Indaba mm -hmm. is, we'll sit and talk, but we're not going to have any decisions. And mm -hmm. it's going to be facilitated around small topics and small groups. And we're going to divide and conquer the, the Global South. We're going to divide and conquer uh, the African primates. And we're going to have little short talks on in the Indaba format where all we do is talk and nobody takes a vote. Nobody responds to the talk and no decisions will be made. But you get to talk all you want. Yes. Rowan Williams used what was called the, the Lambeth Conference under Rowan Williams' authority in uh, 2008, was it, or 10? I forget. Long time ago, yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. Uh, use the Delphi technique. Divide groups into small divide the group into smaller sections. Mm -hmm. Appoint a facilitator who's on your side. Mm -hmm. The facilitator notes all the different views being expressed. So if you have 10 Nigerians and one American, what he reports is 50-50. Here's one view, here's the other. They don't rank them, they don't uh, say how, basically <clears throat> what it does is by using of uh, administrative uh, uh, tricks, you drown out certain voices that you want drown out and magnify voices that otherwise would not be heard. And that's and then you come to no conclusions because no votes were taken and you can't say, well, they would f for this or for that because the way the whole system was set up to avoid doing this. Um, well, the uses a form of the Delphi technique except Welby, flat out, I don't want to say that he lies, what does he do? Spins. He uses, he, spins. he yeah. spins, he spins and he takes something that, and do read the Anglican Futures uh, op-ed, um, you can find it on their website, we've reprinted it on Anglican Inc. Mm -hmm. And it really does make a powerful statement upon the duplicity of the Archbishop of Canterbury in this. I, I should mention something, it's not just Maybe it's just Rowan, uh, Justin Welby, but I filled out the credentials for the Lambeth Conference for me. Uh, unless Great Uncle Clarence dies and leaves me a pot full of money, I don't think we're going to go. Uh, it's expensive week, and we probably want to save our money for the GAFCON Conference in Kigali. But, uh, you know, they're going to li live stream most of this stuff, and... Uh, lots of rules and regulations and at the close of the press accred accreditation uh, paper was this statement and I'll read it to you the Lambeth conference reserves the right to deny withdraw accreditation of journalists from media organizations whose activities run counter to the principles of the conference uh, and that's going to disqualify Anglican TV ministries see we're a Christian organization and I could see how that would run counter to the current uh, Church of England. Now, in, in fairness here, I filled out uh, credentials to attend the press conference after the primates meeting. They sent out a little uh, thing. I clicked it, filled out all the credentials, and waited to hear back from them. And I didn't hear back from them, so I, I think I make the list of uncredentialed Anglican entity uh, for obvious reasons, George. Well, according to these things, uh, you're not going to see any Catholic newspapers because Mostly. Catholics are contrary to the principles of Anglicanism. Yeah. You're not going to see secular newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you're only going to see yes men if they enforce this. Now, you and I, we've been to like two, three Anglican Lambeth conferences. Um, 
with Ruth Gledhill's move into the Catholic world, I think I'll be the person with the most seniority if I, they allow me to participate. And that's just uh, it. We, we have been previously accredited by uh, the Church of England, by uh, uh, Church House, by the Anglican Communion uh, for uh, two decades. It would make little sense unless you uh, think that uh, we are atheist of some sort or pagan uh, to not allow us to come. So I fully expect uh, Lambeth to en enroll us in press credentials. Well, we'll see what happens, yeah. but because uh, we will cover it, um, and if the money is there, one of us will be there. Sure. Um, but these are tight times, and uh, my wife has given me a list of home improvements to do, so I don't know what I should do. Travel Honey, to England for a week or a sure. or retile the bathroom. Well, hold on. You could be there, go there for some architectural ideas for your house. You know. True, very true. Yes, yes. So let's also do a follow-up story. We talked about Roland Williams' uh, letter to the prime minister in England requesting that when we have a don't pray for uh, the gay people uh, uh, law, we need to include don't pray for transgendered people. And there's been a lot of follow-up in the uh, internet this week as to that. We commented how ridiculous it was because, you know, if you read Romans 12, it tells you to uh, be transformed and transform your body by obedience unto Christ, uh, unto God. And so le let's revisit what this week has taught us about Rowan Williams, George. Well, on uh, Monday, May f April 4th, Rowan Williams was the chief signatory of a letter to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, encouraging the government to add transgendered people to the list of people that you can't pray for or can't try to convert. Mm -hmm. And the throw and the line that has caused all the grief for Rowan Williams is this: to be trans is to enter a sacred journey of becoming whole precious, honored, and loved by yourself, by others, and by God. This has caught, you and Kevin, you and I went through this of how awful this is and how uh, basically mutilating yourself because of a psychological disorder is now a journey towards wholeness, it's mm -hmm. the complete antithesis. Well, others have weighed in on this um, from a theological perspective, from a biological, sociological perspective, this isn't going away. And one of the things, the takeaways is that Rowan Williams has really lost a sense, his, some of his credibility as being a wise fellow by his maybe political instincts taking over from his theological ones. Or is he at that age where he's just kind of slipping? Yeah, we've seen that uh, across the board. Uh, where, well, he, you know, the, how old is he? Oh, he's in his early 70s, but Ron okay. has moved back to, yeah. he's moved back to Abergavenny in, uh, in uh, South, South Wales, and he's retired as the master of a Cambridge college, and I think he, because he's been in the news twice this week, and uh, one good thing, one bad thing. Uh, the bad thing, this letter, and people, Real theolo I don't want to say real theologians, real as opposed theologians. to us fake theologians, <laughs> uh, but <coughs> people whose views are appreciated for the theological rigor have basically said that Rowan Williams does not understand or seems to have forgotten the doctrines of human anthropology. Rowan Williams seems to have forgotten the concept of conversion. Are you converting to love yourself? Are you converting to make yourself whole? Are you converting to Christianity to conform your life and your will and your person to the image that of Jesus Christ and what he's called you to do? Well, or are a, you seeking to be in every way and every day I'm getting better and better? Here's a great chance to, to I'm just gonna read uh, Romans 12, uh, one here in two, I guess. Uh, I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable 
and perfect. That's the opposite of what everyone's saying. <laughs> you know, uh, <sighs> well, he had a busy weekend because the day before, April 3rd, he was on the BBC Radio 4 Sunday program. Mm -hmm. And on the Sunday program, he called for the World Council of Churches to expel the Russian Orthodox Church for not being Christians anymore. Hold on. Um, uh, most of the churches in the World Council of Churches are not Christian. True. The, uh, <laughs> that, and to be perfectly honest, uh, one of the things I learned years ago from editors, if I started a story saying World Council of Churches says, nobody reads after the word says. Including World Council uh, of Churches. It's yes. Churches. But Rowan thinks, I think there's a strong case for expulsion because we've seen these signs and those signs were when churches are actively supporting the war of aggression, failing to condemn nakedly obvious breaches in any kind of ethical conduct in wartime, that other churches do have the right to raise the question of whether they should now, end quote, whether they should be in fellowship. Mm -hmm. So Rowan Williams is, uh, yeah, I think that's a fair statement about the Russians. I don't particularly care about the World Council of Churches. Mm -hmm. uh, he also took aim at uh, the Patriarch Carol and he said, your own flock are being killed in Ukraine by other members of your own flock. It is your responsibility to condemn the killing of your own flock for who you are answering to Jesus Christ. Uh, for you are to answer to Jesus Christ. Um, that's true. That's very true, now, absolutely. And now, here's a funny thing. Um, Kirill, on that Sunday of the 4th, uh, I'm sorry, the third. Kirill gave a sermon, which we well, mentioned well, last I, week. I notice we have a lot of new viewers. Who is Kirill? Kirill is the patriarch, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Okay. He is the Francis. He is the Justin Welby. And, mm -hmm. uh, he does not have the powers the Pope has, but he doesn't have the lack of powers that Justin Welby has. Mm -hmm. Kirill on Sunday the 3rd gave a speech at the Cathedral of the Russian Army in Moscow and he supported the holy war against that it was taking place in Ukraine and he backed the government's support and he essentially backed the army. This caused a big backlash because one of the things said that you know Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Russians are all part of one family, one people, the Holy Rus, Holy Russia. Uh, this caused a bit of a backlash, and there are groups in the Orthodox world outside of Russia that are condemning him. We published uh, one or two op-ed pieces on Anglican Inc. from prominent uh, Orthodox. Uh, the St. Sergius Institute, the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Seminary in Paris, the students are protesting. They want to be moved out from the Russians onto uh, the Patriarch in uh, Constantinople, Istanbul. Mm -hmm. So there's things going on here. Well, this past Sunday, the 10th, Kirill gave another sermon at the consecration of a church in a new suburb on the east side of Moscow. And I want to read part of it because this is a veiled criticism of Vladimir Putin. Now, preaching on Mark, uh, what was it, Mark 12? Uh, or Mark 20. Uh, did, 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 Mark yeah, 10. Oh, my. Mark 10. You're right, Kevin. It's my you're job. You're the better Bible scholar than me. Mark 10, 32 to 45, about the disciples. Who will be first uh, and who will be at the right hand of the kingdom of God? Hmm. Kiro preached a sermon about power. And what he said was that those in power have that authority but it is not for their personal use, it is for the common good. And when they no longer are achieving the common good with their use of power, then they should go. Now, let's tie this all together. Kiro believes the Ukrainians and the Belarusians, as well as the Russians, are all one people. And Rod Williams has said, your people are killing your people, you need to speak out. I think he just spoke out. Yeah. In the circumstances of Moscow, where it is a totalitarian state, it's uh, it's not a place where Michael where Michael Curry can get in front of the Lincoln Memorial and say all sorts of kooky things about Donald Trump. Nobody cares. If Carol crosses Vladimir Putin, that's big news. So, 
Putin's sermon, and we'll publish extracts of it on Anglican Inc. once I finish translating it, is essentially saying, Vladimir, you have, are answerable to God for what you do. Is the authority he has given you, is it being used in a godly way? Now, well, Putin, now, he, he goes on to say that there are just wars and we need to protect our people from the evil West. But is what, hap is, what is happening now godly? In two previous statements, Curl has said this is a just war. Mm -hmm. So, is he changing his tune, or is this trying to enhance his tune? Yeah, you know, so... I think, from what I'm saying, is, and if I look at the other stories on the Russian Orthodox Patriarchate's website, mm -hmm. there's a story about they're feeding 30,000 refugees uh, from the city of Mariupol, which is the city under siege in uh, the southern, on the coast of the uh, Black Sea. Um, I think we're seeing a subtle shift. Yes, it was a just war when Ukraine was being a pawn of NATO mm -hmm. and having rockets that could reach Moscow in three minutes from the Russian border, meaning the Russian air defenses are totally useless against rocket attack. Yeah. It's the same argument that John F. Kennedy had about putting missiles in Cuba. It destroys our ability to, uh, you know, the first strike capabilities are useless if the Russians can get in and destroy us before we can even know that they've launched. So that, I think, in Putin's mind. Yeah. But with the looting and raping and pillaging that we're seeing, and I'm sure it's getting back to, to Kirill, is is this, a, is this going a little too far? It's one thing for the Russian army to destroy Chechnya, because they're Muslims and they're foreigners. It's another thing to destroy Ukrainians. If you are an yeah, Orthodox who, who are Rus who are Ruskies, according to Carol. So yeah, And who, who are members of the Orthodox Church. Church yeah. So uh -huh. just it comes back. All right, so this is the season where we post Passover messages and Easter messages on Anglic Doc Inc. And I see that we're getting some up already, George. Anything notable out there? Foley Beach wrote a good one, and that's our cover story that we put up last night. Mm -hmm. A lot of these, like the Michael Curry's, I could write by, if I had a computer program, I could write it. I mean, it's... An uh, artificial intelligence computer program could write 90% of these Easter messages. Um, I'm My thing I do every year is I look for the word Jesus somewhere in an Easter message. And when I find about 12 to 15% of the Easter messages we post on Anglican Inc. from bishops and archbishops around the world do not contain the word Jesus or Christ. <laughs> I'm like, either I'm doing it wrong or they're doing it wrong, you know? Well, we have to say, Kevin, that uh, there are no Catherine Jeffrey Shorey gems so far. Uh, there are no denials of the Christian faith. There are no whacked out... Uh, things that uh, con contradict the creeds so so far mostly it's anodyne stuff and i'd like to slide a little bit sideways okay that there's a blog called archbishop cramner it's very popular in I england love that it, blog, talks, yeah. it talks about things and uh he's posted uh something about uh, the effectiveness of the church of england's media operations and he quoted a uh, he's he, he cited a Twitter a, a, another website, and go to the Archbishop Cramner website and you can read this for yourselves. But he compared the reach of people talking about spirituality and spiritual things. I'd say on YouTube every year. A year ago, Richard Dawkins tells a theology student his degree is useless, that has six hundred fifty nine thousand views. Russell Brand discusses religion on Facebook, 952,000 views. And then he says, now let's look at how the Church of England is doing. Ooh, no. The Archbishop of Canterbury's address to the Anglican Communion, 4,000 views. Oh. And probably half of those were because we printed it and linked yeah. it to there, and yeah. they get credit for that. The Bishop of Exeter's Easter message, 62 views. The Bishop of Chichester's Christmas message, 57 views. The Bishop of Reading talks about uh, the climate conference in uh, Edinburgh, 
21 views. 21? The Bishop I, of Turo's yeah. Driving Home for Christmas hom Homily, mm -hmm. five views. And he makes the point that these dioceses spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on communications and getting the word out and getting the message out. And a Christmas homily gets five views. Now, Kevin, you and I have talked about this in the past about, you know, we're just amazed at how few people actually look at the official things from the uh, Church of England. But this is... Well, we do this in humility. I can't believe people watch us. Okay, and you and I talk about this all the time. You know, it's very humbling to sit down uh, twice a week, press the record button, talk about whatever we want to talk about, and we've grown an audience over 15 years doing this. And, that, and we have to say, now isn't that true, Kevin, that we do have about 10 lawyers watching us to make sure <laughs> that we can be sued. <laughs> right. So we may have a little bump there of people looking uh, to uh, do us down. I do get the occasional threat of lawsuit, more for Anglican.inc than for this, because this is pretty much, you know, unassailable because we call it unscripted and we always use the word allegedly when we talk about you know people who've been arrested and charged so i you know yeah and so numbers are important we told you before audience that the church of england and the church as a whole has lost its voice and if you want to see what that looks like go look at the viewership numbers 21 views for a bishop that goes to a climate change conference and talks about it I'm not surprised he got twice as much as I thought he would you know 10 would just be the office staff mm -hmm. you know and so he's probably at home click 11 click 12 <laughs> it's trying to trying to get the number so well in our in his defense uh, he's his wife is probably like our wives Jill and Susan told us on Sunday they don't watch the show, oh. so <laughs> they, they used to watch it when we had the bloopers, and you know people ask why don't you do bloopers anymore? We do, we haven't. I'm waiting for bloopers, but George and I have come to enough of a understanding of how this works that we don't commit the bad bloopers that we used to do. Um, we have some tech issues with well, but Kevin, what does it say about the church that people like us who could be called critics? not critical but critics of the church we look at it from an outsider's perspective with with an insider's knowledge There's, yes we may have 40 50 times the viewership 100 times the viewership a thousand times the viewership of a, one of our episodes than some of these bishops than some of the insiders talking about official church things what, why why is that well, I would only one third of our audience watches us because we are critical of the church. One third watches us because we have the rapport. We're friends, and they like to hear what we want to talk about. Uh, the other one third are interested in the topic of the day. What what was the title? What was the thumbnail? And what and, and we're drawn to to that. And that's kind of just the basics of, of a show. And we're not watched solely because we're critical of the Church of England. We pray for and we hope for the future of a vibrant Church of England that is full of people worshiping not just on a Sunday but throughout the week, uh, that is changing the culture and the life and transforming Britain. We pray for that. We desire mm -hmm. that. We are not a critic of the, the need for the Church. We are a critic of the leadership of the Church. And I think that comes across. You know, I, I think people understand that we're not here uh, criticizing the real work the church is supposed to do. We're critical of the broken church. And Christmas and Easter, I'll print on Anglican Inc. Uh, as many links to church leaders' messages as I can. Uh, some some years I have a little bit of extra time, and I'll move from. I'll try to get all the primates, no matter what. Then some years I'll add as many American bishops, ACNA, Episcopal, as many Church of England bishops, Irish bishops, Canadian bishops, basically our readership areas, and those who go and publish those. Now what I have found over the years, and you and I have talked about this, is that certain bishops will get a, a disproportionately large viewership. 
Philip North, who is a suffragan, who is a suffragan bishop in the Church of England, will get m more views of his sermon on Anglican Inc. than will the Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell. Now, why is that? Is Stephen Cottrell less important than Philip North? Absolutely not. But Philip North says something. He does something. And hit people are attracted to him as a preacher. So hierarchy does not, uh, status within the church does not necessarily translate into influence. Philip North in his spiritual talks is much more influential than Stephen Cottrell has ever been, Cottrell has ever been, in my opinion, based on the numbers. In this day and age, there are people in the laity that are more powerful than archbishops uh, in their influence through blogs, through um, uh, just influence they have, whether it be financial, whether it be they have the ear of somebody, whether they do a program uh, of this. And it's a strange time because this has never existed uh, in history except at the level of corruption when uh, people were influencing popes or buying land or selling uh, a wife to a pope you know that that was th those are times gone past this is a different age an internet age where uh, two gentlemen can turn the webcams on and talk 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 well some some will remember that uh, last year i was invited to apply to become stand for elections bishop of springfield and i I just went through the first round before I withdrew because it really wasn't the right spot for me and it wasn't God's will. One of my uh, Episcopal bishop friends said to me, George, I don't understand why you would do this because in you, you and Kevin have a far wider reach, a far wider influence than the Bishop of Springfield ever will. And you know, we thought I thought about that for a minute and I don't really care about that because I enjoy doing this. Sure. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's not well, that it's not that we want to be influencers, but we just feel called to speak our minds on these things. And absolutely, we have to do this in humility. Um, if I get up in the morning and say, "How can I influence the church?" I'm doing it wrong. If I get up in the morning and say, "How can I glorify God?" I'm on the right track. And I, it, we talked about power before. Yeah, Carell talked about power. I have a lot of what we'll call influence or power through this show, and I have to do it to glorify God. If I'm glorifying Kevin, right. if I'm doing if if I'm doing this to glorify Kevin, I'm doing it wrong. And trust me, I'm not worth glorifying. It, it, God is worth glorifying. Christ is worth glorifying. We're coming up on Easter. Let me talk about the glory of what we need to glorify here. And so, now, now, yeah. Kevin, if the Chinese government, the CCP, or if uh, the Episcopal Church in New York came to us to offer us money to influence people, you mean oh, you'd I, turn I, that I down? Be, come on, no, no, no. I, I can be bought. It's the price keeps going higher, you know. Yeah, but uh, no, come on. I can be bought. I'm a, I'm a human. There's got to be some price. I can't think of what it is. Maybe a tank of gas for the RV. Maybe. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, a discount card at uh, at Pilot or, or Love's uh, diesel truck stop that would do it. All right, let's move on to some other news. Um, there's big stories because as Christians we fight culture wars day in and day out, and part of that is we have to use our speech and be able to speak in the public square and give our opinion and use reference materials. Why do we believe what we believe? Well, here. Let me open scripture. This is what I believe uh, through faith in Christ. And there are certain things in scriptures that may offend you, but I want to use this as a reference. And in uh, Finland, a bishop and an MP were brought up on charges because they referred to scripture. And that is hate speech uh, to some people who were offended by what they said. And George, we have a great story that uh, after going to court, they were acquitted. Uh, by a lower, a lower court so far. I was looking for their names, but they're Finnish names and they're unpronounceable to me. Yeah, you'll never get that. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Pavi uh, Rasanen Ra 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 and Johanna, uh, the bishop, 
Poppy is the 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 female MP, and mm-hmm. uh, Johanna is the uh, bishop of this Finnish Evangelical Lutheran Missionary Church. They're sort of the ACNA of the Church of Finland. They've broken mm-hmm. away. They were quoting the Bible in defense of their views on homosexuality. And Pavi's husband is a pastor in the Church of Finland, a conservative pastor. And she's the former Minister of the Interior of the Church of Finland itself. So these are prominent people, a bishop and a former government minister. Well, the prosecutors in uh, Helsinki or someplace uh, charged them with hate crimes for citing the Bible in support of their views. And they were acquitted by a jury and the judge dismissed the charges. Well, the prosecutor has refiled the charges on appeal and is asking the government uh, to intervene and it may even take this to the European Court of Human Rights. So the state, the uh, the man, the powers that be are not letting this go. Yeah, They're trying they to squash Christian witness in the public square as being hate speech, and they're going to use every trick they can to do so. Yeah, so it's this, amazing. We thought this was over because in America, if you're acquitted, you're acquitted. But evidently, yeah. in the Finnish system, you can the prosecutor can appeal a loss. Well, not uh, uh, it's not just you're acquitted. You're acquitted. There can be appeals up in different courts. We have a, we have appeals courts. It depends whether it's criminal or it's civil as to the, the the trajectory it takes in our court systems and stuff like that. And if you're a lawyer, please correct us in the comments. Let people know what, what's real here. But uh, um, uh, this, there's a reason Paul says don't go to court um, or don't be sued or sue somebody else. All right, George. So that talks about that. that that's good news for us because uh, here a court said, listen, we can't interpret the Bible for you. Wow, that was the response. You know, if this is the Bible that says, this is what the Bible says. Let's move on. We're already here at like 51 minutes. We haven't hit divorce yet. It's a bigger topic than we uh, have time for. But basically, there's a discussion in African province about uh, spousal abuse and divorce. Which is greater? Who shall come first? A uh, very popular gospel singer, a woman, uh, Osanachi Nowachukwu, was killed by her husband in a domestic abuse incident. Husband's been arrested for murder. Evidently, she suffered for domestic abuse for years. And there's a big de- debate in Nigeria over domestic abuse protecting women. And the general secretary of the Church of Nigeria released a, uh, uh, a speech saying that God hates domestic abuse. God hates divorce. Jesus did say, I hate divorce. Mm -hmm. But then he goes, and I agree with both of those. God hates divorce. God hates and condemns domestic violence. But then he went on to say that uh, divorce is not the biblical answer. And I have to respectfully disagree. I may not understand his point entirely, but I do think that domestic abuse is a reason Well, I have counseled women who are victims of spousal abuse to leave their husbands Mm -hmm. and not said to them, well, you must obey your husband, and if that means getting hit, just take it and pray for his soul. I said, if he's going to kill you, get out of there. You know, you you can't uh, stay. So I don't know if I, well, I do know that I don't agree with there is never a just cause for divorce when domestic violence is the issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, clearly the case can be made uh, that if your husband does not love you more than Christ loved the church, uh, he shouldn't be hitting you, abusing you, and it may be time to step back and uh, uh, appeal for divorce. He, he said, uh, Paul Dager, that's his name, that's his name, the General mm-hmm. Secretary, in his sermon, it was a Palm Sunday sermon that's been reprinted widely in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. If God hates divorce and God hates domestic violence, why are we now disobeying God in approving divorce and obeying God in stopping domestic violence? So the issue really is not divorce, not whether to approve it or not, but to deal with the root of the matter, what brings domestic violence. Again, I agree with him. But a prohibition on divorce 
Um, I don't think... That's certainly not the tradition in the ACNA or the Episcopal Church. Um, yeah, I don't know what they have in Nigeria. Here in America, we have no-fault st- divorce. And no-fault mm-hmm. divorce has ruined our culture and certainly ruined families. Uh, there has to be you know, some type of um, accountability within divorce. Um, and, you know, I'm not the person. I've never been divorced. I don't intend to be divorced. Mrs. Carlson probably, you know, th- considers it once in a while. Um, but uh, so I, I can't really speak to this. And I've never co- had to counsel a, a victim of uh, domestic abuse. So Well, let, let me read another passage grade. from this sermon, which sure. I think really does uh, where I have the problem with what the the General Secretary of the Church of Nigeria is saying. Husbands are to love their wives, and wives are to submit to their husbands, because that is what the Bible says. It says we should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The husband should love his wife as Christ loves the church and died for the church. Fine. True. Then he says, the wife must submit to her husband just as the same Sarah submitted herself to Abraham, her husband, and called him Lord, my master. Mm, that's pushing things. Ooh, that's hard. So now we go. So if we do all these, it will help us. I do not think that the issue is disobeying God by saying, okay, let there be divorce. The issue is let us correct what brings about domestic violence. True. But how he gets there and saying that the wife must submit in all things to the husband because she is his lord and master. I disagree with that. Yeah, I think that that's a per- I actually think that that's a perversion of what scripture says. Yes, uh, we have these statements about how a husband should love his wife and a wife, all this and that, but we don't have, uh, we cannot use that as a cloak for evil and there are evil husbands out there who abuse their wives who molest their children Mm -hmm. um who separation and divorce i believe is the right and godly thing to do not to basically uh penalize them for the rest of their life i should pray for the sinner you should do all these things i that's independent of all this But what just telling a woman she's got to take it, yeah, I don't agree with that. What a great chance to go to the comment section and tell us what you think uh, of this and uh, your experience with this, especially pastors and priests. Um, yeah, I'd really like to hear from you in the comment section as to how you deal with this topic and what your opinion is of this topic. Uh, it's a difficult one, especially in this day and age, uh, when you, you read in the headlines people who've been abused. Uh, George and I live in Florida. Uh, the, the the headlines in papers that says Florida couple n- normally ends up with one of them dead. Um, and they're, they're, they're an interesting read into broken relationships. And you're like, you know, where would we have divorce in this? Where would we have reconciliation in this? And so um, please, please add your comments to the comment section. Um, keep names out of it. But if you could uh, please uh, let us know your thoughts, that'd be that'd be wonderful. All right, George. And you know, because yeah. some marriages are made in hell. Uh, mostly <laughs> they should be made in heaven, but some are made in hell. Oh man! All right, I think we have covered everything. Yep, we got it all. So good. All right, that was uh, the Friday episode. We'll be here back for a Tuesday episode um, update. Both my eyes have been fixed now. I actually see in three D and have depth perception for the first time in about uh, two years. I want to thank you guys for your prayers. Uh, George has a house now. We thank you for uh, praying him through that. And uh, I'm not going to say life is back to normal because we're Anglican. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And when did I stop beating my wife? It's just about the time Kevin stopped. (laughs) And you've been watching episode 772. 727 there you go of anglican unscripted you had the right numbers that's all that counts <laughs> <laughs>